But today, uh, I want to give you a quick talk. Welcome, folks. I'm going to get started right in the hour. I want to talk a little bit about MedVR because it's a kind of new uh, organization. Um, so I want to let you know about it briefly. Um, we are centered around sharing knowledge about and developing new applications using augmented reality, virtual reality, and mixed reality in healthcare. And one of our missions is to see the community of healthcare professionals of all types, along with technologists and scientists and creating cross-discipline teams that way. So uh, our aim really is to grow this very diverse community over the years by sharing expertise and knowledge. And um, what's very exciting, I think also in 2021, early 2021, MedVR has an educational curriculum coming. And what's interesting about that is it's coming about six months ahead of our first hackathon. So. I think we might be the first organization ever to think about the kind of real deep education that we could give to individuals who are interested in this cross community from clinicians to technologists to try and get towards a hackathon that's really powerful, bring something powerful to the table. Um, so none of that really happens without our sponsors. Um, and so I would just, let's see, talk about the sponsors for a second. Uh, if your organization would like to sponsor, please get in touch. Um, we always need the sponsorship. It's a new organization and everybody is doing all of this um, for, for uh, no pay. We're all working to try and bring it to everyone. Um, let's see. Um, I do want you to uh, know about the website. It's medvr.io. Um, and then as far as housekeeping during this talk today, please, please feel free to talk to everybody about anything in the chat, um, where you're from, what you're interested in. Um, but if you have questions during the talk for the doctors, um, please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we'll go over those as many as we can at the end of the talk. Um, so we're gonna... Um, start moving into the talk a little bit now. Hopefully everybody knows that. I'll re-remind you about the Q&A um, tab in a minute. Um, so it's my great pleasure today to have like two real innovators here in the field of XR and healthcare. And they are very busy gentlemen. So uh, Dr. Uh, Nawab is the director of the Computer Aided uh, Medical Procedures Research Team at both uh, the University of Munich and the John Hopkins University and has secondary faculty appointments at both of these medical schools. So uh, if you don't know of his work, um, he has worked for three decades in this area and has more than 40 US patents and 50 international patents uh, in his name as the inventor. Um, so he's truly someone that most of us know about. He's a very business, busy scientist and we're very fortunate to have him today, here today with us. And he will be speaking with Dr. Greg Osgood, who is the Chief of Orthopedic Trauma at John Hopkins Hospital. Um, Dr. Osgood joined John Hopkins after nine years of active duty with the US uh, Air Force, where he taught orthopedic trauma to medical professionals going into combat zones and was deployed himself doing more than 400 surgical procedures in the field. Um, so that kind of cross, uh, Dr. Osgood is also involved in multi-center uh, clinical research. And one of the reasons I bring this up is we've had a number of talks where we're very focused on what does it mean to do clinical rigor around the use of uh, XR in medicine. So um, Dr. Osgood is a trailblazer in the use of AR um, and particularly speaks about even in his openings um, about the use of live XR, uh, I'm sorry, live uh, x-rays through the use of AR in surgery. So they have worked together um, and they're gonna share some of their work together uh, today. Um, I hope that gives you a small indication. Their bios are up on the website, uh, but they're really huge trailblazers here um, for many years um, and we're very lucky to have them. Um, so I, want to remind you again, uh, we're going to do Q&A at the end. If you have questions for the doctors, let me just uh, give up my screen share for you. There we go. If you have questions for the doctors, please use the Q&A at the bottom. Please use the ta chat to talk amongst yourselves. And I'll give you a, if we, if, we, if we run over, both doctors will be able to stay for about 10 minutes, but we may not be able to get to all the questions, but we'll give it our best go. Um, and I will give you a 10 minute warning if it's, if it's run long, but trust me, if you run short, we'll have lots of questions from the audience. So I will leave it in your hands. And if you need anything from me, just let me know.
Thank you. <laughs> I have to unmute myself. Uh, good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening based on where you are. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to, to be here together with, uh, with Greg. Uh, we have been working together for the last eight years, but it's the first time we are sharing a talk together. So uh, expect uh, surprises or us going over time, or <laughs> etc. But it's really a pleasure to share this time with, uh, with Greg and uh, give you a little bit, I want to you know, the, uh, here together with Greg, we want to tell you about uh, a little bit of history because uh, in the last, uh, you know, seven, eight years, uh, there has been a lot of development in AR in terms of companies, uh, you know, focusing on that and putting a lot of funding in it. Uh, but in fact, it's good to know uh, the, a little bit of background and what has happened in this field. And in particular, we only focus on medical AR in, in this talk. So let me tell you a little bit about my own uh, group. And then uh, Greg will tell you a little about his. And then we start to, to attack the core of the subject. So we, in, we have a kind of large team uh, of computer aided medical procedures in both places at uh, Technical University of Munich and Johns Hopkins. These are some of the pictures of different things that we did. Uh, our group is called CAMP. Uh, this is the current group in Munich. They're the ones who are sitting down with some guests also and on top the group at Johns Hopkins. And this is a history of about 17 years at uh, Teu Technical University and about eight years also at Johns Hopkins. Our team is focusing on different aspects that we need to put together in order to get to medical augmented reality, including also computer vision, machine learning, about a third of the group is doing computer vision, almost 80% of the group does machine learning. Then we do a lot of medical imaging, uh, data visualization, and uh, my interest is really in computer and robot assisted interventions. And I think medical augmented reality is the interface to, to all of this. Uh, one of the philosophy of our group since many, many years uh, has been that basically in order to bring anything into surgery in particular, you know, disrupting innovations such as medical augmented reality, you need to, uh, you know, I, I would say uh, you will be punished by the weakest link of your system. So whether it is in segmentation, registration, imaging, visualization, interaction, communication. Therefore, you not only have to have all chain of it perfect, but also you have to integrate it into the surgical workflow and improve and validate it. And this, without working with uh, clinicians, this would be impossible. And uh, therefore, we work with many, you know, medical doctors around uh, the globe. Uh, but I put only uh, 12 of them here. But in particular, I want to mention, of course, Greg and Alex from JHU, but also, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Uh, Mazda Farshad at Zurich in Bulgaria, and then a lot of clinical partners, including AKI Oider and Simon Weidert at uh, Munich or Dr. Meyer or Dr. Feusner. So what we, one of my PhD students was telling is that after working Java at Fotui, after working many years with us, he found out that what we are optimizing is the cost function is, uh, which this cost function between surgeons and computational scientists where we want them to be co-localized. This is the X, Y, Z, spend a lot of time together. And then bring their knowledge and information as uh, converging where they come from completely different fields to bring them and try to converge them. And that is what uh, my group is trying to do all, all around. And now I leave it to Greg to talk about his uh, group and his department at, at JHU. Go ahead, Greg. Thanks, Monsieur. It's a, a real pleasure to be talking with this group. It's an honor. Uh, I'm excited to share a lot of the unique interface that Nasir and I have had in bringing new technology to the OR. 
and uh, developing technology that still uh, is, is coming for complex orthopedic surgery. Really, we're, I'm focused on the orthopedic side of things. And uh, so this is where I work in, in the clinical hospital. Um, it's a close interactive environment for, with medical students and uh, all the students at every level and the BME scientists. Uh, my clinical team is four clinicians uh, and we do hundreds of operations per year each, uh, but we only spend about 80% of our time fixing fractures. We have about 20% of our time to do research and work with uh, engineers in the center. So about 20% 20 of, 20 of our time is engaging BME and getting people to come to the OR, getting them to interact hands-on so we can bring the science to medicine and medicine to science. The, the idea of the surgeoneer is really uh, an evolving concept, a new nice concept of bringing the surgeon and the engineer close together and making the engineer part of the team. So here you can see with a pelvis uh, image, you, you see our residents and the technicians who run the robot and make things happen and uh, working together to streamline the process. And so it's been a pleasure with Nasir to work uh, and interact bringing uh, surgical observation his engineers have come and talked and watched me and say, why do you do this? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, and identifying uh, hurdles that I may not even see and ways to overcome them. So this next slide shows the day we received our first AR glasses from Oscar Health Design Group. And you can see the, the shared excitement from the clinicians, but also the scientists, because we're going to bring this to the field for the first time about six years ago. So surgery has been performed for thousands of years. Uh, some of the first evidence shows surgeons, uh, primitive surgeons working in the Andes, creating trepanations in the skull, opening the cavity of the skull so that the blood and humors can be evacuated and saving people's lives, uh, protecting people from seizures, migraines, and mental disorders in attempt to cure patients. Um, and so this, is, this goes back, you know, millennia. Um, early surgery was performed without any data available. Here you can see um, early surgery being performed very crudely. Tasks were performed without imaging, very simple procedures. Hopefully we can get this video to work where we see an amputation being performed at the turn of the 20th century. And this surgery was performed without aseptic technique. You'll see that the surgeons are not using gloves. They're not using masks. They're operating in uh, an office, it looks like. Uh, and they are, they're, they're, performing this amputation in a very crude way, breathing all over the operative field, but really no guidance at all other than what their eyes see. You can see them looking around in 3D space. They have no capability to navigate this procedure without moving their bodies circumferentially around the, the OR. And at the end, you'll see that the, the surgeon takes a nice bow. He's very proud of his work. Uh, the next uh, surgery is, is um, from one of our surgery icons, Harvey Cushing. Dr. Cushing had an understandable dislike for the bloody practices. I hope you hear the sound. Do you hear the sound? Right. First surgeons wore rubber boots yes, we hear and it. rubber aprons simply to keep dry. Cushing's team wore white shoes, immaculate reminders of the careful hemostasis which was expected of everyone. This is the 1940s. Dr. Cushing's reaction to the cameras was a mixture of tolerance and impatience. The photography was done with his permission, of course. I'm just waiting to show the, also the operating room the and then taking. we can move on. When he felt that something was unimportant, such as the scrub up, he tried to stop the cameras and several times he deliberately blocked the view of the operative site with his shoulders. <laughs> However, this did him little good, for whenever the view from one camera was blocked, the other camera took over. He soon caught on to this and gave up. At the end of the operation, Dr. Cushing wadded up a wet sponge. So this is brain surgery be being performed without any imaging. Um, and this is uh, in the 1940s. Um, our current um, surgery is much more technical, much more involved from 3D space and 2D imaging as well. The initial x-rays were performed just over 100 years ago by Rentkin. And the hand x-ray you see there is actually his wife's, um, the first x-ray that really was documented. Interestingly, uh, x-ray was first used in the OR about a one month after this discovery. So you can see the importance of this 2D imaging. Computerized tomography, PET scans became uh, very important and in new innovations. Refined uh, imaging capabilities were, were developed, defining 3D capability. MRI was a Nobel Prize winning innovation, 
presenting 3D data for surgical treatments. Here in the next slide, you can see that the uh, original orthopedic surgery really relied on visualization through direct visualization, no imaging. And this is an exposed bone that was destined to die because we intervened too much. In the next slide, you'll see the current techniques in 2020 involve, uh, if you should pop up the picture, a more biologically friendly approach where the, the bone is not exposed too much. And you can see that the surgery, surgical interval is actually much smaller. This requires imaging. It requires a lot of 3D understanding. And this is only possible with combination of efforts of the BME folks with surgeons. So here we're, we're inserting a 40 centimeter plate into someone's femur uh, and uh, only through small incisions, as you can see on the next slide. This requires the precision of fluoroscopy. You can see in the, in the posterior aspect of the, the image uh, and continuous evaluation and multiplanar assessment. Now this is the fluoroscopy alone, but ideally we'd like to be able to combine this with arthroscopy or live CT imaging uh, so that we can present the data and in a relevant way and use it in a continuous way without cognitive disparity. Here you can see our latest innovation. This is about a year old uh, 3D imaging that we acquire in the OM in any period during the surgery. And this allows us to assess the uh, position of bony parts as well as soft tissue and really to use live 3D imaging that's uh, at the instant that it's acquired um, in the OR. So the next slide sort of jumps to what my work is. This is the focus of percutaneous screw placement. In orthopedic trauma, we use this the synthesized 3D data by primarily using 2D fluoroscopic imaging in multiple planes, and screws are placed over these wires. The next slide shows one particular example that the wires can be uh, 15 or 20 centimeters in length. And so the precision of advancing these wires down a one centimeter corridor of bone is really enhanced, as you can see in this image, only by 2D and 3D understanding of the operative field. So here you can see the fluoroscopy that's alternating between this image, uh, if you'd advance, Monsieur, the, the, this image and the next um, is really acquiring 2D images that we as surgeons synthesize in our brains to make sure that we understand what's being done, ultimately achieving a final result of multiple screws in the pelvis, uh, which are, are long, they're deep, and only tiny little incisions, about two centimeters each for each of those screws that are placed. Now, I, I mentioned bringing the engineers to the OR. Uh, when they came to the OR, they snapped this picture that they, they love showing because it shows all of these little tiny um, points where I entered the skin with my wire without significant precision because we weren't using 3D technology. We weren't using any form of navigation. We were just using 2D imaging. So this, this image shows up in a lot of our papers. So why are we struggling so much? Well, even with CT and X-ray in our OR, we're not really happy with the visual field and the user interface between the operative task and the imaging data. We can't really assess ongoing anatomical changes, landmarks, trajectories that we really need to understand and implement the use of 3D imaging in the operative field. So here you see at my operating room, which is pretty primitive. It's limited in its imaging presentation. Uh, the use of images is really limited in its integration into the surgical workflow. We have to bring in equipment the 20th century or 21st century OR really should contain all types of imaging data that can be combined, synthesized, but even more importantly, presented in a more efficient way than you see here. Navigation has been around for about 20 years. Navigation uh, systems are costly. They take a bit of time to set up and the learning curve can be pretty steep for surgeons uh, in being safe and effective um, for managing injuries and, and treatments. And our current um, navigation systems truly aren't acceptable. Here you can see that we're looking elsewhere. We're looking outside of the operative field. We're not looking uh, in an ergonomic fashion that it facilitates this, the surgical uh, skills in our hands. And then in the next slide, you see that we have to then go and communicate and think we understand each other. Um, this is the current state of the art. So we have communication problems and really don't meet uh, the requirements of the surgery. And, and our tasks at hand. For decades, we've recognized the need for better visualization and user interfaces. And this is the state of the art OR. And this is one of them in Germany that has a CAT scan machine, an OR type device, a fluoroscopy unit and imaging presentation. But here on the far left, you can see that there's still a pelvic model just in case we don't trust all of our innovative techniques. 
and we have a pelvic model that we can put our hands in and under hands on and understand in 3D space. I'm going to turn the uh, mic back over to Nasir and he'll talk about some of his developments. Uh, so basically, before starting, thanks a lot, uh, Greg. So before starting talking about our own development, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, you know what was what started in '92 very early. Uh, and what was done in that 15 years uh, in that early time, uh, some of the real pioneers in that sense. So in 1993, uh, Henry Fuchs and his team at uh, North Carolina, they, they, they were very ambitious, even though if the power of computation was really ridiculous at that time, uh, they still imagined that they could do augmented reality. They wanted to uh, visualize, uh, you know, uh, ultrasound directly in the view of the of the head mounted. We will see that because of the power of computation, tracking, synchronization, and all these issues, they had to wait for Frank Sauber and his team uh, about seven years later to bring those concepts concepts to some practical things. Uh, but also very early in 95, uh, Eddie Edwards and Dave Hawks at King's College at that time to get work together with Zeiss Medical and integrated, uh, you know, a display into microscopes of Zeiss at that time. And uh, they actually showed pre-segmented vasculature of brain into the microscope, direct view of the microscope. It was very interesting. However, at that point, the problem was that this thing, these vasculatures were supposed to be behind the, the, you know, the tissue. And this depth perception turned out to be a little bit more bothering than helping. They were at the beginning very excited, but gradually they were telling, turn it off because I can't see, uh, you know, this is not the right place. And then the problem of perception and integration into workflow bothered them. In 96, uh, Ron Kikinis and the team at uh, Harvard Medical School, uh, they started to take, uh, you know, external monitors. This is Ariana Abavi, the surgeon there, taking the external monitor and then take the segmentation of CT in their collaboration with uh, Eric Grimson at uh, at, M, uh, at MIT Media Lab, and then visualize at MIT actually AI Lab, and visualize it externally. But again, the problem of depth perception and workflow integration was there. In '98, uh, when I was at Siemens Corporate Research, I came with a combination. At that time, I thought that the eye of the orthopedic surgeons inside operating room is actually X-ray. So I started to put, we will see later, to combine visual and x-ray together at all time. Uh, and this was called CAMC at that time. In uh, same years, uh, DiGioio put a display that they, they called AR window between the surgeon and uh, the patient. And here in this window, he was showing actually the preoperative CT. This is real-time x-ray, this is preoperative CT. And uh, Stetten, uh, George Stetten at CMU also created, uh, put a, a summer transparent display next to ultrasound to be able to show the ultrasound directly onto the patient at the moment of doing ultrasound. Most of this work had problem with 3D and with, uh, and uh, with, sorry, with the 3D and visualization and also integration into the workflow. Later in 2000, uh, Wolfgang Bilkferner in Akaha, Vienna, uh, create, uh, you know, put uh, displays into magnifiers, called it varioscope, and uh, tried to use it for maxofacial surgery. The problem was, again, a problem of multi-object tracking uh, with precision and also workflow integration. Uh, Ken Masamune uh, integrated uh, a display into the CT uh, and uh, you know, very similar to the concept of George Stetten, but this time instead of ultrasound, it was about CT and it was giving an argumentation directly. Finally, in 2000, Frank Sauber, Ali Kamen at Siemens Corporate Research, they put together what the, the dream of uh, Henry Fuchs and created a, a, a head-mounted display 
uh, called they called it RAM, uh, and uh, which was uh, with that power of computation at that time it was this the whole thing was co costing over 50k, and but it was allowing to do the augmentation and it was very good system. The major problem was again depth perception and workflow integration. And in uh, IRCAD in uh, France, in Strasbourg, uh, Stefan Nicolo and Luc Soler at, in 2004, they also started to use multiple cameras and do augmented reality, similar to the one was done in Harvard, but now much with better computer vision and better, uh, you know, more, uh, more fancy visualization. Uh, however, again, they had the problem of uh, precision, depth precision, and workflow integration. Uh, so a little bit about our own work. So in 98, uh, I did this camera augmented mobile C-arm. The idea was that you would attach a camera inside the X-ray, next to the X-ray source inside the C-arm. Uh, and you would co-align it once forever. So there is no more calibration because of this double mirror system or single mirror system, the camera here or double mirror system, the camera next to the X-ray source. For one time calibration in the factory, X-ray and optics would see always the same thing. This was a very early publication at that time. And this was the very first uh, image of humans uh, done in 98, which was published in 99, where optics and X-ray at all time were always co-registered without any markers or anything. This was just by construction of this very simple dabber mirror system, or with, you can also put the camera here. So it took, uh, uh, you know, oh, just in between, uh, we started now at 2003, I came to Munich and I decided that I go with my team directly to the hospital and try to bring both the HMD and CAMC into the augmented medicine and into the operating room. So at that time uh, in 2005, we, uh, we had developed some additional visualization on that uh, HMD of Frank Sauer and Ali Kamen, and we brought it to, uh, to some conferences of surgeons at that time. And we were allowing to visualize, uh, you know, uh, slices of CT and interact with it directly on the body of the patient. And uh, it was very attractive. It was also allowing to do volume rendering and, uh, uh, and you know, a slice view directly into the uh, HMD. Uh, however, they, we tried it in surgery and the surgeons succeeded using the camera augmented mobile C-arm, but uh, they did not uh, succeed with this augmentation. And one of the major issue was again, perception of real anatomy and the virtual anatomy. And in that year, some of the essential work we did in 2006 was actually to develop methods which would allow better human perception of virtual inside the Lear, real, such that you would not recognize, you would not make a difference between real and virtual. So uh, this was at that time. Uh, now, the very first deployment of augmented reality in, in real operating room uh, was uh, done with, uh, by our team and uh, two of our young PhD students at that time who created a company called Sergic I, uh, Jörg Traub and uh, Thomas Wendler. Uh, we had this product, which was actually CE certified and FDA approved in 2008 and 2009 and went to many uh, thousands of sentinel lymph node biopsies where they would do gamma reconstruction, spect reconstruction, we called it freehand spect. And then they could see actually the nodules directly during the surgery in augmented reality or in virtual reality. We did a full study of hundreds of surgeries showing that in different phases of, the, of surgery, they may have preferred virtual reality to see the distances, the sizes, the locations, or during the surgery, at the start of the surgery, to see it in augmented reality. 
Then in 2010, after about 10 years of invention and testing uh, of cadavers and animals of uh, uh, camera augmented mobile C arm in Munich, we brought it to 40 surgeries and uh, by done, done by 14 surgeons where they could now, instead of what uh, uh, Greg was showing that you do the X-ray, but then you have to imagine the mapping, they could see directly the, the tar X-ray target and up to in their hands at the same time. So they did 40 surgeries. This was until 2011. And then I came in 2012 to Johns Hopkins and that's where I, I, I met Greg. And uh, a lot of advantages in particular with the introduction of 3D cameras, we could also now put the, the detector, the disk cameras, instead of next to the X-ray source, we could also put it next to the detector. I ask, uh, and this is the, the camera I was talking about, and I ask Greg if Greg can tell us about the advantages we had together during a few years uh, with this new system now. Thanks, Nasir. So, when I first saw this, this was a, a fascinating um, technology. It was new to me. And the idea of layering and mapping all of these types of imaging data was uh, unique and special. And all of a sudden, the wheels started spinning about where to go. This is a depth camera uh, attached to the, the fluoroscopy unit. This is not a particularly new fluoroscopy unit. It's, it's decades old. But it provides a cone beam CT that registers the 3D space from an X-ray standpoint, the depth camera, uh, RGB data uh, to provide a surface environment. And um, all of this together allows you as the surgeon to register okay. all the data. But you can see from this image that the surgeon or the, the person executing the task is actually looking away still from the field, uh, not at the surface of the body. Uh, and the next slide, um, Maybe, uh, Greg, I've, I've pushed it too, too fast, so I didn't show. There is a part of the video at the end with Alex. I, I, so I messed we, up. we see here that no radiation is used. The hands and tools are simultaneously visible. Uh, you can see the surface. You can see the inside, where the tool is in relationship, um, no matter how you look at this field. And uh, we performed several phantom studies to validate a successful performance of operative tasks and uh, found that we had one of the most important things is a tremendous surgeon satisfaction uh, in using all of this data simultaneously. It's a unique presentation. And we found that a lot of our novice surgeons could execute very complex tasks because they had this sort of video game mode uh, idea and background so that they could uh, really streamline the mapping and the 2D, 3D registration in their brains uh, by the combination of all these data together presented on the screen. So at this time, the surgeon, Alex, is uh, a very junior resident, but he was doing very advanced skills. Um, but this made us really ob made it obvious that we needed something we can use in real time. And we've been trying to optimize the combination of, of these techniques using HMD and surgery. We wanted to be able to look at the display without averting our gaze. And, uh, and this is really only possible using an HMD. So we see all the 3D data through the HMD. Uh, we first tried to do this um, by using it literally projected into the uh, space, but really we found we wanted to have the physics of the x-ray beam in the operative field at the time. So the idea of the interactive flying frustums was uh, derived, and here you can see the, the surgeon's uh, representation of, of what he's doing, executing multiple uh, fluoroscopic images in multiple planes and acquiring the data, presenting it in the field in a way that makes sense with the relationships of how the, the image is acquired, the multiple points of the source, the multiple uh, presentations of the image, and really aligning and mapping that image to the 3D anatomy of the patient on the table by the use of the HMD, creating an augmented reality uh, environment that we can use uh, on the fly. So we can interact with this data and we can layer all of the images and reassemble the surgical workflow as well. So we can go back and relive the operative experience and teach it. We can uh, go back and, and express 
all of these presentations over time. Here you can see uh, one of our latest projects of uh, bringing this really full circle, bringing the HMD into the surgical workflow uh, by defining the surgical preoperative planning. This is all done on the side in our virtual OR, defining entry points for uh, surgical tools, trajectories that we're going to pass the tools so that we can stay just like in that pelvis with all those, those uh, uh, cylindrical trajectories, we can stay in the appropriate plane and orientation. Now you'll see me struggle a little bit with the, the UI for the HoloLens. It hasn't, HoloLens one wasn't really perfect from a surgical surgeon standpoint, from a personal experience, but we've seen it evolve over time. And you can see that this has been an amazing integration of the imaging data from the planning uh, software all the way up to the hardware insertion. Here you can see we're using and realigning a real tool with the, with the, uh, the computed tool in the, in the virtual space and inserting a wire into the anatomy and executing a task using our preoperative planning. And prior to this, this wasn't possible. So uh, there, there are a lot of ways that we as orthopedic surgeons uh, can think of applying this technique and making sure it's universal in our practice. You can see also the, that we're going to use this technology in the future for orienting uh, hip instruments and a lot of different tools. Um, we can talk more after this uh, presentation. Monsieur, I think it's uh, your... Thanks, Eric. Thank you very much. I, so now what you saw in the, the previous examples was uh, in particular in camera augmented mobile CR was that we were uh, putting multiple images together. But the problem of augmented reality and the, that I showed you in the history was also the fact that when you just put data on top of each others, then you, you bring more information, but you, be, you also clutter it. And you, this integration is fusion, it's not integration. So in order to integrate, we bring artificial intelligence into the game, which means for now I want to combine X-rays and optics instead of doing what I showed you in the left-hand side, which was just optics and X-ray together. Now we do a semantic, uh, you know, classification of every single pixel in optics and x-ray. So I can decide that I want the bones to be visualized in white. I want what to be visualized in optics and what I want to borrow from x-ray. So suddenly what you see on the right hand side is exactly the same thing as in the left hand side. The only thing is that the opacity is defined by artificial intelligence, which means by understanding the meaning of pixels in X-ray and optics. So now I know that this is my hand, I want to see it. This is my tool, I want to see it. This I want to have a mixture of X-ray and optics for the hand, but I want to see the background not in X-ray, but in optics. So this would allow you to have the future of AI and AR combined in real time. Now, everything we showed up to now was uh, only visual. But visual has its limit, you know, recently since 2014 in optical, in uh, ophthalmologic surgery, they also brought intraoperative uh, optical coherence tomography, OCT. So now this is an eye surgery, this is an actually peeling of the eye, uh, is a real patient. And on the other side, you see the OCT, but the surgeon cannot do a micron precision action and also look at the OCT. The surgeon wants to see events here, but also wants to make sure that in, in depth, in micron, he is doing the right thing, but he or she cannot look at both at the same time. Uh, and the idea was now augmentation can also go to visual, to audio. But if I bring audio in terms of, you know, like beep, 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 and things like that, if you have to do eight hours of surgery and have that noise, you go crazy and you turn it off. So the idea was, can we do music, pleasant music, variation of music, but also bring information? In this video, what you see that we did with Dr. Meyer at the ophthalmology surgery of the Hospital of Munich, the idea is on the right hand side, I'm doing my surgery. I'm only focusing on my surgery. On the left hand side, on the left hand side, I'm focusing on my surgery. 
On the right hand side, the system is measuring in which layer you are and the music, the pleasant music is modified based to give the information in which layer you are. So I hope you got the concept. We, our idea here is to have thousands of selections and the surgeons could actually choose the, the music they want to listen on that day, but the variations would allow them to observe or understand things uh, that would give you the context without, you know, uh, without putting everything in visual, which would be sometimes uh, more, uh, you know, uh, dangerous than uh, of than uh, no, than not having it. So uh, these are. I I think the future would be a combination of multimodality augmented reality. Now, Greg, I wanted to ask you, but do you, Greg, think about the needs for visual and audio augmentation and their integration into surgical procedures, in particular? Now, if we combine video and audio, what do you think about that? Greg? Sorry. It's, it's interesting to, to go through the history of augmented reality and all the surgical innovations you, you've come up with and to, to understand that we've really made advances in accuracy, accuracy in time and in, in 4D really, um, and, and presentation. I think there's a lot that we need to advance further in computer vision and depth perception from a surgeon's standpoint to make sure that the accuracy of the integrated images is um, really reflective of what we're doing. Uh, we, we've talked at length about this, but the current state of the art HMD is really not designed for medicine. And I think there is a true opportunity to innovate specifically for medicine. I think we don't need to rely on the technology being important for uh, engineering or other science or gaming. I think it's really particular to address the needs of the surgical field and the surgeon's needs or other fields within medicine. I think there's a real opportunity there. Thank you. So basically uh, I, what I showed was a very small part of what we do. So in order to go where uh, Greg wanted us to go to real precision and also observation inside the operating room, one from my point of view, one of the ways is to do robotic imaging. And in this case, what you will see is that the robot is, uh, because of the 3D cameras on top of the, in this case, a volunteer, but it could be a patient, it actually goes and uh, does a full 3D acquisition of the ultrasound and uh, does a deformable registration of this 3D volume to an MR atlas. And therefore the surgeon can define on an MR atlas, not on the MR of even the patient, on MR atlas, what, can, what he or she wants to measure intraoperatively or reconstruct intraoperatively. And then this mapping is done uh, this 3D volume is mapped to that uh, atlas and then one can guide the doctor to do the, the right thing inside the operating room. Now, when we showed this a few years ago to uh, two uh, surgeons at our hospital, two actually great uh, female surgeons, Anna and Yumi, that I had their pictures in the beginning, they told, oh, this is great. We can use it for facet joint injection on real patients. And they went all the way to take the IRB and ethical approval. And then we went to our first patient. This is the first patient where actually the system went and did an automatic acquisition of the ultrasound volume of the spine. You will see it in a second. It's accelerated by a factor of six. It took 48 seconds. Once it did this volume acquisition, then we showed intraoperatively the, the, to the doctors, they select that the facet joints, they, in general in patients, they are four to five. We had done four surgeries and 20 injection. 
then the robot automatically goes to the, to the slide where the doctor chose from that volume and found the facet joints on it. And the attachment is exactly allowing the, 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 the trajectory they chose. So when they inject, this is a real patient and injection, then actually they can do the facet joint injection correctly, all image guided. And for uh, sake of our IRB, we also did verification with X-ray and they were all successful. The most famous surgeon we had was Merkel. He visited our lab and that, that was what she tried to do and she put it on her Instagram. But also KUKA uh, liked our combination because we want next to go to augmented reality in that scenario. We didn't bring in the surgery, but we want to augment take that robotic acquisition and the surgeon defining things in augmented reality so they could actually see it not on the screen directly and Kuka chose it as one of the abortees in, in the competition. And finally, I want also to show that VR and AR can allow us to uh, go beyond. So in this case, the surgeon, the expert surgeon is supposed to be in another room but with virtual reality, but he, thanks to all the 3D cameras and uh, reconstruction, can see the patient in high resolution and the environment around it all in real time. And then he can guide the young surgeon who is abroad to how to do the surgery. You will see a bit and the, the avatar is representing. So the surgeon in another location is explaining to the other surgeons how to do this cut. Okay. So our idea is to have the patient in high resolution and everybody else practically in avatars, but to be able to turn, you know, this, now this local surgeon is using augmented reality because he has to see the the environment and the patient, the one abroad, which is far used as virtual reality. So this all will come into one picture, robotic imaging, artificial intelligence, uh, medical augmented reality and uh, virtual reality. So before uh, we finish, we wa I wanted to tell you that together with uh, Dr. Uh, Farshad, uh, the head of orthopedic surgery in Zurich, and Dr. Osgood, and a team of uh, really dedicated uh, students. We created a summer school last year um, in uh, 2019 uh, with 24 surgeons, 24 uh, academic people, and 24 from industry. The color of their uh, they're, you know, under, you see, it shows which, uh, they, which group they belong. And it was an amazing two weeks. For one week, the best people in the world came and explained them. And then uh, for one week, they had a hackathon. They also all went and uh, visited many surgeries, thanks to uh, Professor Farshad and his team there. And uh, we had... Uh, uh, 14 uh, HoloLenses and 12 uh, Magic Leaps offered by those companies and their engineers were there. It was an amazing experience and we are hoping that COVID goes away and we repeat this experience this in summer school in 2021 and we invite all of you to apply. I would like to thank all of you to take your time. If you go to our website uh, of me or Greg or to this medicalagmentriality.org, you will see uh, many of this, uh, you know, papers, tons of papers and videos that shows many other things that we do. I thank you and I finish usually in this background. This is the magic mirror that we used for uh, education of uh, anatomy in uh, with about 900 students in medical school of uh, Munich. This is for public, but you, the version you see is for public, but there are more precise versions that we used in, uh, in Munich and also in Johns Hopkins, thanks to uh, Leila Barmaki, who actually I saw she's uh, attending this talk. 
Uh, also, uh, she did it with 350 students at Johns Hopkins. Uh, thank you very much. And it's time for me and Greg to answer any questions that you have. Oh, that was wonderful. Thank you very much. I'm sure everybody is just floored by all of this. It's amazing. Um, I want to remind the audience to please put questions in Q&A, um, other than would you please employ me? <laughs> we, we always get that like from the amazing trailblazers. But if you don't mind, I have a couple of questions to start it off with. Um, sure. I Before we go into that, I won't pull up my slides, but I, I just want to remind everyone that on November 4th, at the same time, we actually have the next talk. It's the Living Heart Project, crowdsourcing the virtual twin of the human heart. And we have... Uh, Dr. Stephen Levine, Dr. H uh, Hoganson from Children's Hospital, and uh, Dr. Val from uh, uh, Tufts will be moderating that one. So that's really going to be a cool one, so you can watch the website for that. Um, so I don't want to take over the screen because I just love what you put, had put up there. So, uh, But um, I actually, the ending of your uh, talk here made me want to ask both of you about this sort of training, particularly with the use of different multimodal uh, controls, um, because the notion of using gestures is so difficult if you're conducting surgery, because you're using your, your hands so much, I would imagine. Um, and the kind of timeline, let me just make it a really complicated question so you can talk for a minute about it, the timeline of mm -hmm. democratizing this. So you really could help someone who's more junior learn to use these tools at the same time you're helping them use them. So can, can you talk a little bit about that? How hard was it to, to use the interface, Dr. Osgood? How long do you think before it will be easy? Will it never be easy? How much kind of training, like when we talk about the multimodal, we wanna, both of you probably discuss that for just a moment. Um, maybe I can just say what's in, in surgery, even before AR, uh, markers have been used you know, direct tracking of people's extremities, fingertips and things to demonstrate how efficient we are. And in those trackers, you know, optical trackers are, are pretty accurate and, and easy to use, uh, but, but we, we don't want to always want to be relying on that. We, we should be able to have something that recognizes anatomy. I think it is just a, you know, a couple years off probably from what I'm seeing already, the advance between whole lens one and whole lens two, I think there's a tremendous advance in in gesture recognition. Uh, I think the ability you know, to integrate a little bit more AI into that, I think will, will help the advance of the science behind it. Um, there are also presentations of, or, or different technologies in the past five or 10 years that have allowed layering and, and not really the head mounted display AR, but other methods of AR that make it a little bit cheaper and more accessible, especially if you're trying to do this with remote countries who are poor. Uh, I think that's another way to, to do it and make it possible. So there are things that are already out there from a low tech standpoint, um, but new technical innovations coming, I think, that I think Nasir can talk about. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Greg. So basically we do have also together uh, at Johns Hopkins with Greg and others, uh, we have a, a lot of you know, research in training and teaching using VR and AR. For me, this is crucial because not only because we can train the doctors because we need to change the culture. And when you go to an operating room with AR, doctors uh, focus at that point is really the patient. So they don't want to learn new things. They want to save the patient. But when you go to teaching and training, they have this mindset of, actually training and learning something new. So this is for me is the best place to bring the new technology and, the, and experiment it, uh, go through it, and then they have the right set of mind. And at the same time that you improve, we improve our systems, they adapt to the new technology. So after a while, when they really get into an operating room and they see a new augmented reality system, they would be also very, it would be very easy for them actually to use it. So for me, is a two-sided story of, you know, one would be the fact that we could actually uh, use, you know, do augmented reality for training, but also they can at the same time uh, change their culture and make them actually get used to that. 
Yeah, I think the training aspect of, you know, as we start using it in the medical schools, they're just much more comfortable with it. Not that everyone's not a gamer at this point, right? <laughs> um, but uh, so I, I think there's a democratization topic of the ORs with all the capabilities and AI that you add to XR and then what you can put in the field with AI in a headset that's affordable, you know, kind of that area. Um, I was interested in where do you, when do you think where our timeline is? How are you feeling about the timeline? What's going to happen in the next two to four years, do you think, with this? And um, I want to, both of you talked about evolution, but Dr. Osgood, you really were saying, hey, I, I think we're going to branch from, you know, the Oculus to the real medical kind of headsets or something, if I was inferring that right around that. So would, if either of you'd like to talk to that for a moment. I think there is a, a real leap that will happen suddenly. And I'm not sure what the trigger will be. Uh, I think the trigger actually will be pulled when people start to use it more in education. I think education is the key because the accuracy doesn't have to be so high for a, a student of multiple different levels to visualize what's going on in the OR and to experience it in a way that means so much more than when I was a medical student watching surgery, holding a retractor and not seeing anything except my own hands. You know, I, I think there's a real opportunity to deliver a thousand times much more information to the student with no need for more accuracy than what we already have. So I, I think that's where the leap will happen. And then I think companies will start to uh, realize the economic potential, which will drive the, the presentation of a, a medical specific um, device. Now, not to um, hump a, a previous yeah. talk, but we had Dr. Dernick from Brussels and he was talking about total beginners, you know, medical students, but using AR guiding pins, it was just amazing their accuracy when you added it. Um, he said, you know, the experts became perfect, but the early students became 90% and it, it just so blow your mind, right? Kind of stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, so something I have to mention, there is uh, uh, a kind of hype when a new technology comes, like when HoloLens comes, but you should not forget that HoloLens or Magic Leap were made, did not, they were not designed for surgery. Not at all. They were not even designed for medical. They were designed for mass market of entertainment and, uh, you know, education and etc. So for me, in you know, the, 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 the leap we will have next is to design solutions for surgery, to design head-mounted displays who communicate with X-ray, with ultrasound, who have the ability uh, to integrate into the AR. So an HMD, which is designed for, ex, you know, explicitly for surgery, a software which is designed explicitly for surgery. So I think now we have all a toy to play and show the capabilities or possibilities. But for me, the real leap in surgery happens when they are fully integrated solutions, you know, not only demonstrations with, uh, with systems which are not designed for this purpose. Even though those design and those demonstrations are really cool and they give us a lot of ideas, but they will not be the final solution from my point of view. They will come. <laughs> Great, and um, so we have a couple of questions from the audience. So one is particularly interested in recommendations from both of you around uh, what people should read that are newer to the field. Um, if you, what well, I would say, you know, study your works, but um, is there any kind of, in, in particular recommendations that you would make to a newer person that's coming into the field in this area? Someone studying, this person studying biochemical, uh, biomedical engineering, excuse me. I think one of the interfaces, um, I, I'm looking at my, my wall and there's a bookshelf over there. I don't think the world learns through books anymore. And so those textbooks have a lot of dust. I think the real experience where people's eyes open and their questions and their minds really transform is when you come to the operating room or come to the, the experience because you bring your questions and, and your viewpoint. And, and I think with the most novice mind uh, in, in a field that you want to bring this technology, I think you can see things that you can make better. 
Uh, and so I would encourage every novice to come and, and experience the most highest concentration of learning, <laughs> just immersing in the OR. So I know, I know surgeons, you know, they're hands-on, so that's what they always tell you, and, uh, but it's not easy. But something which would be easy, actually, in this website that I, I presented at the end, medicalaugmentedreality.org, we have gathered about, I would say, 50 papers and about 30 videos where we put a lot of papers, including a state of art in medical AR, many technical papers about AR, and also about 30 uh, video descriptions of different technology of AR. So I strongly recommend them to go to that website, medicalagmentedjobs.org, watch the videos, download the papers, and then if they have questions, uh, there is a, last, a list of about 25 experts there. Uh, about seven of them are surgeons, uh, the rest are technical, uh, and they can answer, all of them, they can answer the questions, definitely. Super. I would That's... say medicalaugmentreality.org. <laughs> Super. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. And also you had a list, and this is being recorded, so you had a list of some of the papers over the history. And I think those are all amazing, you know, the, some of the work that's sure. been done and each one of those has papers associated exactly. with it to understand the background. Um, so the next okay. question um, we have is about the, um, about the ultrasound uh, robot um, and how you calibrated the device. Did you use landmarks specifically? How did you, how did you design it for spinal surgery um, uh, in combination with the HMD? No, we have, the, so uh, we have a system which went to the surgery and we have the system that we have developed but it's not gone to the surgery, that version of it. So the version we went to surgery, the surgeon told it, told it to start from here and go up to here, and then the system did it automatically. Uh, however, since then, I mean, not since then, in parallel, we have uh, paid two papers this year and last year in robotics and uh, automation letters and ICRA, where we use machine learning uh, the first one is we are using reinforcement learning. When you leave the robot on top of the patient, wherever you want in the back of the patient, the system with reinforcement learning once finds the sacrum. Uh, this is a paper by Farid uh, Azampur and us. And the second one is a paper by Maria Trendelli, again in robotics and automation this year, where uh, from sacrum, that robot is actually combining the force, which would be like a surgeon touching the vertebra, uh, touches, uh, it, it combines force and ultrasound image to count the level one, two, three, four, come to the level that the surgeon is interested. Then the robot rotates and makes a full uh, acquisition. Actually, while maybe you can ask the second question, I can try to show you that, uh, that video of that work it shows you how you can actually develop it. Uh, how we have done it, but for those automation, we need a lot of more time to go, uh, more time to actually get it into operating room uh, and get IRB because there is more automation. So for the one on the real patient, we had to wait, uh, we had to actually do it, uh, the, the, inter the positioning of it was interactively. Um, so it, you did mention the IRB, and, and one of the things that comes up usually are, are the kind of uh, timeline effect and the cost associated with mm -hmm. becoming approved. And if you had any you know, insights to share in that area, um, that comes up every single talk, like how to get through approval with the FDA, not how to do it, but how much of an impact is it in order to, to enable it, okay. get through Let the process? Me... Let me first, uh, sorry about that, but let me first share the video of the methodology I was talking sure. the work yeah, of great. Mari, uh, Maria Trinidelli to work that, to show that work and the paper is in role. So this is the robot comes now automatically. This is not on a patient, this is on a volunteer. And the robot combines force and ultrasound with machine learning with a network and based on the combination of the force and image, the robot uh, decides, counts the levels and comes to the right vertebral level automatic, fully automatically. 
Once it arrives to that level, then it rotates and give, makes a full uh, acquisition of that particular level of vertebra. Once we get that particular uh, vertebra, then we do again, thanks to machine learning, we detect the facet joints automatically. So you would see that in this case, a combination of the reinforcement learning and force plus image, you actually could do the full thing automatically. But now answer to your question, if such an automatic thing is much harder to get an IRB or, and then later also certify it, because uh, you have to you know, do all kinds of validation. As soon as you say that the final control, final decision is on the hand of the surgeon, then things becomes easier. So that's why I recommend, like we work with uh, uh, Christoph Loise at Stanford and what he does there is, uh, you know, even if you can do automatic alignment in augmented reality, he involves at the end the surgeon to do alignment because as soon as the surgeon confirms the alignment of the multimodality to the patient in augmented reality, then the certification becomes easier, even if they touch it and they confirm it, because then the responsibility goes to an expert human rather than expert machine, which expert machine needs to be a, a lot validated, but expert human has done 20 years of studies and a lot of boards of here and there. So that expert is already confirmed. So this is, uh, this would be my answer. That's, so I would say the first step towards automation, both for uh, or certification for robotics or for, uh, for AI and AR is bringing the surgeon into the loop and making sure that, the, that there is at least a touch of a surgeon telling, I like it, is at the right place. That's why Da Vinci also came with a remote control and nothing automatic. So I would say those will make certification much, much, much easier. But the process, you have to go through process anyhow, but it's much harder if you say uh, it's fully automatic. It's more attractive, but it's harder to certify. Well, and I think we have a societal, global societal change to start believing in AI, right? So mm -hmm. we're gonna need a long time, even if it's more precise, to believe in the ethics of AI. So there's a lot of research in ethics and AI right now everywhere, right? So, sure, sure. Um, but um, so Greg, you've been answering questions, doing a great job. And I don't know if any of them, if you wanted to talk to any of them at all um, around the question around the joystick and when things will occur. Um, so hey, feel free. Yeah. There's yep. a good question about the joysticks and can you use joysticks as an interface rather than uh, hand recognition or gesture recognition? And we've, we've done some of this. Uh, personally, from a surgical standpoint, I think with my hands. So uh, for, I, for me, and I think for most surgeons, interacting with surgery will be probably with, with hand recognition or gestures ultimately, but it's not as smooth as it needs to be right now as far as accuracy and um, just, just the recognition software. Joysticks, you can learn how to use them, but they're, they're a little, that one step removed makes it a little bit harder to use. Um, but with time, you know, even I could have learned it. So I think most people can, but I think ultimately in every aspect, whether it's just uh, commercial, uh, commercialization, medicine, gaming, hand recognition, body recognition is really what we're striving for. Well, and can I add a follow on to both of you around that one for haptics? Knowing that AI will take over for some of the things that we do you know, in the future, how important do you think it will be to tie uh, what's physically happening to your hands with haptics or, or something like that. How, how do you, I'd love to hear from both of you on the haptic feedback um, and whether you think it will be important and where you think it's going. I think the real answer should come from Greg because he is the surgeon. I can tell you technically haptic is extremely hard because technically the perception of our, our perception of vision and hearing is much a lower frequency than the haptic. We are much more sensitive to the haptic. And therefore it's, it's much, much harder to reproduce a realistic haptic than the realistic image or a realistic audio. Uh, 
So technically, I can tell you it's much more difficult to be very realistic with haptics, even though it's great. But whether it's useful and how important it is to have it, the surgeon should answer that. Yeah, is it a blocker? You know, like, <laughs> what do you think? I think I like, oh, I love this discussion. But uh, I, I think our brains are capable of processing a lot more information than we are currently teasing it with. Uh, we're presenting visual data, and I think there is a lot more to do with auditory and vibration and uh, uh, heat or something, temperature, that we can attach to devices going forward that we can learn from. So we can get lots of stimuli coming from different directions and, and get feedback. I, I've used tools where you're haptically guided into a pathway um, and, and using passive robots and such. And I think these are really great technologies for, imagine remote surgical mentoring, right? Across, and, and if you can guide someone with better precision and haptic feedback, I think this is a great way to reassure that the accuracy and, and safety of these devices can be uh, guaranteed from a distance. I think the more, the more types of feedback you can get is a better guarantee for success and safety. It's a great question. Yeah, it's really, it's worth hours of talking where the line is, you know, on that one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a couple of other questions that have come in about uh, tele um, uh, monograms. It looks like, it was, am I reading this properly? Um, event sensors is maybe probably what we were sort of talking about, the pictures you showed where, um, uh, I'm not actually sure I understand this question. Let's see, how about tell, tell a monogram when the equipment and sensors you use and hardware- oh, no, Telemonitoring. Oh, telemonitoring. Oh, so a mentor student. You know, it's funny that mentor student part or remote consult, like world expert that you need right there to help you understand something. I think they're... they're sure. I can tell you this, this remote mentoring. Actually, uh, we just got this. We, what I showed is the results of a German uh, research foundation project that was with multiple groups that we, we led. Uh, but actually, uh, about five months ago, the same German institution came to us and told us that they want to give us more funding, even without we asking for it, because they wanted, uh, in case of COVID, that the head of the ICU not be forced to go every time there, but rather, but they didn't want only to have a video, they wanted him to be communicating with his staff and really being able to fully, uh, you know, feeling that, that that person is there and checking every bed in ICU. So I would say it's coming. Uh, we, we started on that project. They gave us the additional support to go towards that project. So I think it happens. So one thing my wish was, and we submitted the European project that unfortunately didn't go through, was to have it in ambulances even and in helicopter. And I think Greg can say that in many traumas, the first one hour or 40, 45 minutes to two hours are the most important part for survival of the patient. And the idea was if we have 5G uh, and we you know, with cameras and sensors inside a helicopter or a ambulance, can we have the same thing that I showed, but being able for the surgeon, at, for the doctor at the hospital already decide which operating room has to be ready and what, uh, which bleeding, what is the source of, these, of the problem uh, after this crazy accident, for example, because the problem difference is that in an accident, they have no idea what is coming up. Maybe Greg can say what you think in this case, this in general, this telemonitoring role can be with augmented and virtual reality. And the challenge of, I mean, technical challenges are there. So we, we heard this at Mackay, the ability to teach remotely, the ability to really have a greater impact at a distance is the essence, what we really need in medicine, especially. Um, the military wants telementoring and telemedicine from a hands-on standpoint. Uh, clinical medicine commercially has been available to do remote rounding with a robot going with a screen of my face and just you, you go from patient to patient, but that only is, it doesn't gather much data. 
And the idea to use haptic feedback or other ways to assess AI something um, to gather more data really will be the, the next step in that technology. But people already want it. Uh, and I, I think from a global health standpoint, this is going to have a, as big an impact as having you know, a, a cell phone in your hands. Yeah, and I, I tell you, this dot era is so exciting. If I can make one quick comment on that is that, so I've worked in multiplayer for a long, long time in collaboration in combination with avatars. And I find that I've done all this work with retail, but not in healthcare. You know, like retail is using these amazing combinations of virtual worlds and avatars and AR and, you know, and, and I'm not actually personally who, who does this kind of stuff. I'm not actually seeing it in medicine yet well, so it's exciting that you're regulated. looking at it what is it all of those spaces are not regulated yeah and so where you absolutely unregulated spaces and so the safety issues the yep you can see and also ultimately the, the ultimate question who's paying for it for <laughs> so, what escapes the lab what what can make it out right. of research uh, yeah so I, uh, I want to comment i want to say in the terms of technical uh for telemedicine uh in Europe, at least, the government needs to be involved because we found out, for example, you know, when we use data centers to accelerate the transmission of the uh, high quality data uh, in, uh, you know, we need to have priority. And in particular for trauma and things like that, to be able to guarantee a frame rate. Uh, so I think in US is whoever pays more, but in Europe, there is some governmental things that can also uh, regulate it and say, if it's a trauma, if it's a, you know, ambulance uh, comes in, then uh, that, that, that stream gets priority uh, and things like that. So technical, and the speed and et cetera, it, it really matters. And the setup, uh, it, it really matters whether we are able to do it or not and how realistic. So um, we're at the end and I thank you guys so much for staying an extra thank 15 you. minutes. If you have any last word that you wanna say, if you feel like you didn't cover something that something didn't come up, feel free. Um, but if, if not, I'm gonna say thank you, thank you. Such trailblazers and um, yeah. We're going to watch your work going forward and every, you're getting everybody excited to keep working in the field for sure. So thank I want to thank you for your time. Thank you again. And I just want to also say that if, you know, the from industry, surgery or academia, if you're interested in, the, in, the, in connecting with us in medical augmented reality, please contact us. And the summer school is also a beautiful place to, to get together. So let us know, communicate with us and we're looking forward to to interact with you. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Take care. Cheers. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.